I'm Dr. Hill. I've been here since 2001. I'm probably most known in the North Country for bariatrics because uh, we were the only facility that's been taking care of people of weight for 20 years. But I'm also board certified in thoracic surgery, so I do lung surgery, lung cancer surgery, etc., things like that. I also do uh, reflux surgery, hernia surgery, colon surgery, upper endoscopies, lower endoscopies, bronchoscopies, etc. So um, we we have a a lot of uh, a lot of strong history here of, of good medical and surgical care. So um, we have a uh, vascular surgeon here. We have great orthopedics, colorectal, ENT, uh, GYN, et cetera. So you guys do have a choice in your health care as to where you wish to get it. And um, we're welcome, we welcome you to come here if you wish. I'm gonna give you a lot of information and try and break it down as simply as I can. And that answers a lot of questions, but it's gonna create a lot of questions. And of course, there's gonna be plenty of time at the end to be able to ask those questions. We have our handout here today. and We wanna to talk about the obesity and the problems that obesity causes, some of the causes of obesity and the treatments of obesity, the severe obesity. So we wanna help people improve their health through weight loss. And what you'll see is there's a lot of medical issues or problems that are associated with obesity such that when the weight comes down, those other problems also can get better and or go away completely. And that's how we're looking to improve patients' health through weight loss. On page three are some definitions. It talks about bariatrics, which is the study and treatment of obesity. Also, it talks about ideal body weight, overweight, obesity, morbid obesity, super morbid obesity. There's a super, super morbid obesity. And these are all based on the severity of obesity on what's called a BMI, a body mass index. And the best way for me to explain what a body mass index is is to say if I'm five foot eight, three hundred pounds, and a pro basketball player is seven foot four, three hundred pounds, I'd say we're both three hundred pounds. What's the big deal, right? Obviously, that guy is not obese at that height for that weight. So, it's a height weight ratio, and it helps us understand the severity of obesity in these patients. The comorbidity is another term here, and that means to be ill with. Those are those other illnesses that are associated with obesity that we look to improve. And some patients may have a high BMI and not yet have those other comorbidities, but their risk of developing them is 10 times as high. What is obesity? Obesity is actually a disease. It's been certified as a disease only since 2013 by the CDC. And before then it was just a condition, but it's this disease of excess fat storage that results in the deterioration of that person's quality of life and quantity of life. So patients with Morbid obesity have a 15 year shorter lifespan on average. And the condition of morbid obesity has become the number one preventable cause of death. It surpassed smoking for that honor a few years ago. That being said, we want all patients that are interested in having bariatric surgery to be ex-smokers, okay? We wanna take care of number one and number two preventable causes of death, okay? So, page five and six. These are body mass index tables. So we'll use page six. This is the old fashioned way of figuring out what your body mass index is. You can plug your height and weight into a phone app and be able to get a body mass index, okay? But this way, height in inches. If you take on the left hand side, go down to 65 inches, that's five foot five, and go straight across to the middle of the page to 270 pounds and straight up from 270 pounds, that's a BMI of 45, okay? So this body mass index page only goes up to 54, but patients' BMIs obviously go higher. We had a patient here whose BMI was 100. Okay, so you start to look at these numbers and then start to understand the severity of obesity that that patient probably had and the other problems that that patient probably had with their lives. Page seven, this is the important page. Why is obesity a problem? I'm gonna talk about some diseases that don't necessarily cause us discomfort in the early stages, and so therefore we may have them and not even know it. Diabetes is the first one. Diabetes, for those who don't know, is high blood sugar. You can have a sugar of 220, which is high, and not feel different, okay? The problem with high blood sugars chronically over time is that they affect the cells of the organs that they don't work as well. So the eye cells, the kidney cells, the nerve cells, the heart cells, okay? So you often hear of patients who've been poorly controlled diabetic for long periods of time being either blind or on dialysis, or need to have operations on their feet for infections and things like that. So poorly controlled diabetes over long term is a devastating long term disease. The other one's hypertension. For those who don't know that, it's high blood pressure. You can have a blood pressure of 200 over 100, which is high, and not necessarily know it. So you can be walking around with hypertension, and hypertension is probably one of the closest reasons that this can be caused to early death. 
Um, and the other one's high cholesterol. So you can have a cholesterol of 300 and you don't feel it, right? So if you have high blood pressure, high blood and high sh blood sugars and high blood lipids or fats, that's called metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. And syndrome X over long periods of time is what results in early death. And they die from heart attacks, strokes, and cancers. Okay, that's how it, that's how it kills. And the cancer rate for morbidly obese patients is three to five times greater than those of normal weight as well. And this risk normalizes with weight loss. The other one I wanna talk about is sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is when you stop breathing at night. So people with sleep apnea, they don't know they have sleep apnea. The people who sleep next to them know they have sleep apnea. The problem with sleep apnea is, is that the brain doesn't get the deep cycles of sleep that it needs because the cerebellum is waking it up every, every once in a while because it's not breathing, okay? And so patients with sleep apnea are often tired all the time and they may fall asleep at the wheel going to work in the morning, okay? So sleep apnea is also a cause for what's called pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressure in the lungs, but also regular hypertension. So if your doctor has you on three meds for blood pressure and it's still really high and you can't figure out what's going on, you may have undiagnosed sleep apnea, okay? So that's something also to consider. Now I wanna talk about some conditions that do bother us and that we want to get better, okay? A really big one is, is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is the bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. And when someone's heavy, it's the pounds per square inch on those joints, the knees and the hip joints, that wear away the cushions or the cartilage of those joints, such that it's bone on bone causes a lot of inflammation and it hurts and it hurt. people can't exercise, they can't walk, and they often need to have orthopedic knee replacements or hip replacements. These patients and the orthopedists have figured this out recently. The morbidly obese patient having orthopedic joint replacement has a tougher time in the operating room and recovering and the joint doesn't last as long as in the normal, more normal weight patients. So a lot of orthopedic surgeons are referring patients for weight loss prior to having those joint replacements, and that's appropriate. I always tell this story. A few years ago, I had a guy that came to see me literally hobbling in with his walker, and he says, look, Dr. Jones is not gonna do my knees until I lose 150 pounds, and I've been trying that for, for 30 years. And we ended up getting him through the program and doing a bariatric operation. And, and this was in the spring. He came to see me in February. And in August, he had lost 150 pounds. He walks in my office. He's all tan. I said, whoa, did you get your knees done? He goes, no, I'm supposed to do that next month. I said, what? Well, maybe you shouldn't. Uh, you don't get your knees done if you can walk and you feel good. I mean, his x-rays still look bad, but he offloaded the joints. So it didn't hurt, it wasn't grinding as much, and he felt great, and he got three more years before he needed his knees replaced. But that struck me as really, wow, you know? So the other one is um, complications of uh, menstrual irregularities. A lot of young women uh, have polycystic ovarian syndrome and they don't menstruate, and their fertility normalizes with weight loss, almost 100%. If they don't have problems with menstruation and they do get pregnant, they have higher complications of pregnancy. They have gestational diabetes, which is diabetes of pregnancy, and they get what's called preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is high blood pressure, and they spill protein in the urine, and they often have to deliver earlier. The other thing happens also is that women have bigger babies because in the third trimester, their blood sugar determines the baby's growth rate in the third trimester. And then they often have large babies that can't be de delivered normally. They're having C-sections through thicker abdominal walls, which has higher risk of infection and hernias, et cetera. There's a lot of data out there that corroborates the safety of having pregnancies after weight loss surgery. They're having safer pregnancies and healthier babies, okay? So keep that in mind too. What causes obesity? This is usually a college lecture that's about a week long. I'm gonna make it about 40 seconds, so hang on. It took us hundreds of thousands of years to become us, okay? And in that time, we became attracted to foods that we could store easily as fat for calories because we didn't know where our next meal was. You know, we had to chase our meal down. We expended a lot of energy to get our, our energy. So we, we became in love with certain things that made us survive. Expending a lot of energy to try and get our energy took up most of our existence until the last 100 years or so when we've become smart enough that we have automated planting, harvesting, packaging, delivering, etc and our daily energy expenditures dropped off significantly. 
now we can find the things that we love the best in stores right around the corner in big shiny red boxes on sale. We have become in love with sugars and fats. We love sugars and fats. We're addicted to sugars and fats. It's really true, okay? I'm gonna talk about sugars specifically more and more in this talk. And our energy expenditures dropped off. So obesity has become a significant problem in any westernized country or any industrialized country. The United States has a significant issue also because in the 1950s and 60s, it introduced high fructose corn syrup into almost everything, which is just empty calories, but we love it, okay? So sugar or carbohydrates is a drug. It acts the same way in our brain as a drug. If you have Netflix, watch the documentary called Fed Up. It's real, we are addicted to it. It affects the same pleasure centers in the brain as other drugs. And in this documentary, they have lab rats that happen to love cocaine. And they gave these rats the option of cocaine or sugar water. And these lab rats tapped sugar water all day long. Okay, so there's something about the sugar. And not just the sweet stuff, carbohydrates. We love carbohydrates because those we can really easily adjust and, and translate to fat for us for storage. What are the treatments for obesity? So, I'm going to oversimplify this with a simple physics equation. If we absorb more calories than we burn, we will gain weight, okay? I said absorb, not consume. Because we all know the skinny girl that we can eat whatever she wants and doesn't get a pound. They're real people, okay? And if we burn more calories than we absorb, we will lose weight. And we all know of people who go to the gym, spend three hours on the treadmill, don't break a sweat, and Uncle Jim goes and gets the mail, comes back a pound later, right? Because we're all individuals, and we all are different inside. And there's a lot of genetics in obesity. The lay person wants to label someone with morbid obesity as lazy and eats too much and addicted to food. And food ad addiction is rare. A food addiction is really not common, okay? Yes, do we have some consumption problems and choice problems and volume problems? Yes, but that is not what defines morbid obesity. Morbid obesity runs in families. You see a big mom and a little dad, they have a big little kid, they're feeding the same thing, right? It's true. If burning more calories than absorbing results in weight loss, it's called diet and exercise. So who's tried it? More than once, all right, more than twice. All right, so the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, not because it works, because if it did, we wouldn't pay for it. it would just, we'd just do it. The morbidly obese patient is a special subset of the population because that particular subset of the population is for some reason unable to lose 100 pounds and keep it off. I've had many, many patients who said, look, I lost 100 pounds and gained 120. Three times, right? So, you know, that show, America's Biggest Loser, we love that show. We're watching these people lose weight. They're, they're suffering, but they're losing weight. And we never see the one-year reunion of these shows or let's get the last five years winners on a show. We know exactly why. Medications don't do it either. So there's no adequate medical treatment for severe obesity. Someday there will be, but right now there's nothing. Right? And nothing's gonna sneak through the FDA quickly because they tried to do that with FenFen -fen and that ended up with problems with heart valves and all that stuff. So what has evolved have been surgical treatments for the treatment of severe obesity, which have predictable outcomes and predictable longevity as far as weight loss goes, okay? And these have evolved over the last 75 years or so. And I'm gonna start drawing those pictures out behind me. There's two types of procedures there's restrictive procedures. So if I put a rubber band around your esophagus and say, try to eat this, and you go, eh, it doesn't go anywhere, that's restrictive. I'm not gonna do that, but that's what restrictive is, okay? So you understand that. And then, there's malabsorptive. So if I connected my esophagus to my backside and ate something out, it came, I wouldn't absorb a damn thing. We're not doing that either. Someone's like, yeah, I want that one. <laughs> you don't want that one and I'm not doing it. But you get the premise of what malabsorption is now, correct? Okay, so the first one I wanna draw out is more of an historic nature. It's the band, we pass that around. So esophagus, stomach, 
the band goes around the top of the stomach, not around the bottom of the esophagus. There's some stomach above the band. Stomach. And it's, a it's attached to a little port. And the port goes under the skin, and I can access that with a needle and inject saline, which will inflate the little balloon, okay? Or I can take fluid out. I haven't done one of those in a few years because there's another operation that has been far more popular. This. The nice thing about the band is it's adjustable. The bad thing about the band is it's, it's adjustable, okay? And it results in uh, weight loss. When you make this a little bit tighter, when you eat a small amount of food, it just fills the top part of the stomach and it stretches those nerves out of that stomach and it tells the brain I'm full. So the band was great for people who were always hungry or never full, but not great for emotional eaters, not good for people that, that want to eat their ice cream every night because it'll go right through. This results in, a, um, in, in, in decent weight loss in about half the patients, but it's also a, f a f failure rate of 50%. We define failure as losing less than half of one's excess weight. So if someone's 100 pounds overweight and they lose 30 pounds, they've lost less weight than we wished them to lose for them and that they've also lost less weight than they wished to lose, okay? But we have to always compare this to medical weight loss, which is a 99.9% .9 failure rate, okay? So this is a coin flip is way better than 99% failure, okay? So now, and there's, as I should have said at the beginning, there's four surgical procedures for the treatment of severe weight loss that insurances generally accept. And we do all four of them. Many places will do two or maybe three. So this one is not rarely, is not commonly done anymore. It's still available, but now I'm gonna talk about the other end of the spectrum. This is a very simple operation. Now I'm gonna draw out a very complex operation that's also not done very commonly because of the complexity. Most people have to go to a big city to get it. Um, it comprises only about three or 4% of the surgical treatments for severe obesity uh, every year. Um, and it's called the duodenal switch, the DS or the switch. I'm gonna draw this very slowly because it's a little complex. Esophagus, stomach, pyloric valve, duodenum, and small intestine. The duodenum or duodenum, you can say it either way, is a very special place. It's where the bile and pancreas enzymes join with the food broken down with the stomach to break it down to the calories that we can absorb them, okay? So if we don't let the food and the enzymes see each other, you won't be absorbing calories. So just keep that in mind. It starts by making a tube out of the stomach and removing this piece of stomach from the body. That creates some restriction, okay? Then what I'm gonna do is divide the duodenum so food can't get over to where the enzymes are, all right? Then I need to make a pathway for the food to go, otherwise it's just gonna sit there. So I divide the intestines down here, bring up a piece, attach it to here, and switch out the duodenum with this piece of intestine, and then put it back together to itself down here. And there's the large intestine. So food goes this way, enzymes go this way, you don't absorb calories until they meet down here at the common limb. This common limb is about 100 centimeters long. This is about 150 centimeters long. This is about 200 centimeters long. So I'm not removing any intestines, just a piece of stomach, but not removing intestines, but I'm rearranging them such that you're only absorbing over about one-fifth of your whole intestinal length, and the rest of it does go out the other end. Okay, this is a very significant and powerful weight loss tool. It has a failure rate of any 10 to 15%. Okay, note it's not zero. Okay, now I'm gonna draw out the current most popular surgical treatment for severe obesity in this country and many others, and you just got a glimpse of it on that other page. The sleeve gastrectomy. The sleeve gastrectomy evolved from the duodenal switch because when surgeons were doing the duodenal switch, started to do it with the little incisions, they had a mortality rate of 5%. The mortality rate for bariatric surgery should be well under a half percent. It should be like getting your gallbladder out or knee operation or appendix out. And that's the way it is across the country these days in centers of excellence like ourselves. They said, we're gonna do the first half of the procedure with the little incisions, we'll make that sleeve. The patient will lose weight with restriction and we'll come back and do the tougher part 
with them a little less heavy. And they were able to do both those operations with a combined mortality of under 1%. But what they found out was that these patients were losing more weight than the original authors thought they would with just the sleeve. So it evolved into its own weight loss tool. And insurances around these regions started to accept it only about 2008, so it's about 10 years old, 12 years old, and it has about a 30% failure rate, okay? Now I'm gonna draw out the gold standard operation against which all other operations have always been compared. It's been, had the longest track record of being the most popular procedure here for decades, is the Ruin Y gastric bypass. This is one Al Roker had, my, my, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine actually did his surgery. Esophagus, stomach, small intestine, you all have to draw this before leaving. Just kidding. All right, in this operation, we make a small little pouch out of the top of the stomach and we separate the stomach from the pouch. So food can't get in here anymore. Conversely, acid from here can't get up here anymore. So there's your anti-reflux operation. It's a very powerful anti-reflux operation. So like over here, I need to make a pathway for the food to go, so I divide the intestines, bring up a loop, connect it to the pouch, and reconnect it to itself down here. This is called the Rue limb. It goes up and over the old stomach like a bridge, bypassing it, hence the name Rue and Y gastric bypass. So food goes this way, enzymes go this way, common limb is here for absorption. The common limb here is a lot longer than this one, so it's not as malabsorption. This has a failure rate of about 15 to 20% in the literature. A couple things about the bypass. Patients that have bypasses can get an ulcer at this connection. If they take high dose ibuprofen and or uh, a leave or a aspirin, et cetera, or go back to smoking after they quit smoking to get an operation, okay? Um, so that can be a real problem for people who are smokers that feel that they have a high risk of going back to smoking. This may not be a great idea, okay? The other thing that can happen with this is what's called dumping. To explain dumping, if you have normal stomach and you eat something with a higher fat or sugar or salt content and it goes into our stomach, our stomach will push liquid into the lumen of it to dilute what we just ate, okay? And then it churns it up and spits it out in the duodenum in the same temperature as the rest of the body and the same concentration as the rest of the body and things like that. So if we have something with a higher sugar or fat or salt content and it goes into this little pouch for a little bit and then comes out in the small intestine, still concentrated, sometimes the intestines tries to kind of do that same thing the stomach did and it's not good at it. And it feels like absolute hell. Nausea, crampy abdominal pain. People think they're gonna D-I-E. They're not gonna D-E-I-E, but they think they're gonna. I always tell this story too, because this is a true story. I had a guy came in, he was about three months post-op, about 50 pounds down. And he didn't look happy. He looked bummed out. I said, buddy, what's up? He goes, oh, doc, I don't dump. I said, what? He goes, I said, tell me the story. He goes, all right. I was at my niece's birthday party, double death by chocolate cake I love so much, I just wanted a bite. And that's all it takes for people who have dumping, to just get a bite of that. And I said, and he goes, and I said, what happened? He goes, and nothing happened. I said, then what? He goes, I had three more pieces. That's a bad conversation, right? Sugar, the drug sugar. The drug sugar. I now, at these talks, try and talk about carbohydrates as our delinquent cousin. We love our cousin. We hang out with our cousin, we're always in trouble. We don't care if we're in jail. We're with our cousin, we're having the best time of our lives. One day, your, your, your cousin goes to jail, surgery, but a couple years later, your cousin will get out of jail and come over to your house at midnight and knock on your back door and say, hey, I just got out of jail. Can I come in? Oh, of course you can come in. I've missed you so much. Can I stay on the couch? Absolutely, you can stay on the couch. And then after staying on the couch once in a while, kind of the cousin's always there. And then the patient goes, yeah, I gotta go see Dr. Hill. He's gotta tighten something up. Something's going on. Because they're gaining weight. Because they've allowed some carbohydrate back into their daily life. And carbohydrates can be absorbed in this alimentary limb. They don't necessarily always need to have enzymes, okay? So keep that in mind. And so really, 
what I need is to have patients get their cousin an apartment across town. You can go visit your cousin, but you shouldn't be living with your cousin. So the patient comes in after saying, you know, I don't know what's going on, I'm gaining weight. And I said, is your cousin living on your couch? And they go, mm, maybe. Okay, so carbohydrates are a drug. We love them, but we have to know what our relationship with them is. The other thing I want to talk about is reflux. So reflux can cause esophageal cancer. And some people with, this, with reflux will develop precancerous changes of the esophagus called Barrett's. And those patients need to be followed. And if they do develop uh, uh, esophageal cancer, if it's found early, only those patients will survive. And they, and they usually remove that part of the esophagus and use the stomach to replace it. So this type of operation will burn the bridge for that patient, okay? Because we take most of that stomach out. That patient that developed esophageal cancer won't be able to have that done. So, and these are not good anti-reflux operations and can cause reflux in people who don't have it or worsen it in people who do. If you're interested in the sleeve or the switch and you had reflux, even if you have good control on meds and we don't know if you have Barrett's or not, we should look, okay? So if you have Barrett's, it's probably better to think of this. So I've thrown out a couple things out there that helps us decide maybe which kind of procedure might be best, okay? So the two most popular procedures, obviously, the sleeve and the wound like acid bypass. With these procedures, when we're, ma when we're, we're malabsorbing calories, we're also malabsorbing nutrients and vitamins and minerals. So we need people to be on vitamins and minerals um, for life. And this is important, especially with the switch patient. The switch patient has longer term uh, malnutrition issues. Okay, so the, the switch is no joke. You gotta stay on, on task and make sure that you take your, you get your protein in and take your vitamins and minerals, okay? We do advocate that our, that our sleeve patients do take vitamins and minerals too. We have, because we check labs at, you know, at six months and yearly, we have seen some vitamin deficiencies in our sleeve patients, even though it's not a malabsorptive procedure, okay? Now I wanna talk about some commonly asked or frequently asked questions, okay? Frequently asked questions, how long am I in the hospital? These usually two nights in the hospital, sometimes one, but I, I like two nights in the hospital. Um, and how, how long are the surgeries? Most of these surgeries are about an hour. The duty and switch takes a bit longer. They're all done with little incisions. I always reserve the right to make the bigger incision for the safety. The incidence of me needing to do that is usually less than once a year. Um, how long till I can go back to work? So if you have a clerical job where you are doing computers and uh, phone work for the most part. You can go back to work in a week or two if you feel like you wanna. If you have more involved jobs that have more physical demands, it's usually four to six weeks. Um, how long to, till I can have surgery? Some insurance companies require six months of medically managed weight loss even though they know it doesn't work. It's a barrier they like to throw up because um, obesity is the last allowable discrimination, okay? And it happens every day it happens in doctor's offices with insurance companies. It's not okay, but it's the last allowable discrimination. Um, so some insurance com companies require six months of medically managed weight loss. Uh, some don't. Um, those that don't and people that are relatively healthy could be anywhere from three months, to six months before they decide that they want to have surgery and that they're having surgery. Um, how do I choose my surgery? We just kind of talked about a couple areas. All these operations are really good at getting rid of diabetes and high blood pressure and, and sleep apnea over time. Uh, I think the bypass and the switch procedures, when food doesn't go in that duodenum, a lot of patients' sugars normalize very quickly. I sent three out of four of my patients home with those operations off of their diabetes meds because their blood sugars are usually under 150 to under 120 while they're in hospital. Okay, it's really amazing. Some people can lose a little hair while their weight's coming down. Um, the analogy I use is if you're like, you know, four months post-op and you're 70 pounds down or something, the body goes, what is going on? It thinks that the ship is going down and starts throwing cargo off the ship, right? So it doesn't care about hair and nails like we do. Um, so some people will have noticed themselves thinning hair, most other people don't notice that. That hair generally regrows after the weight loss has plateaued. Um, extra skin. Uh, you can imagine that some people might have extra skin if they lose a lot of weight, and extra skin doesn't come off in the gym, it comes off in the operating room. 
I had, a, I had a lady came in and she had some skin on the arm. She goes, I'm trying to, I'm trying to go to the gym every day and get rid of this right here. I said, well, you'd have to fill it with muscle like Arnold Schwarzenegger to get rid of it. It's not, it's not going away. She goes, oh yeah, that's right. So, um, and we do some of the skin surgeries here um, and we will send out uh, other plastics. I, I tell people not to consider any skin surgery until you're at least a year out from the index operation. Pregnancy, remember the, 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 the cargo and the ship thing? We don't want people coming in four, three months post-op pregnant. Uh, those women that don't menstruate will. And those women that take hormones for birth control, those hormones don't work during the weight loss period because there's hormone shifts during weight loss. So they need to use condoms or diaphragms or uh, IUDs. Um, but every once in a while we get someone coming in looking a little sheepish and they're like, I'm pregnant. I don't know what happened. You don't know what happened? But we've been blessed with healthy babies. I think we've had that happen five times or something in the last 10 years or something. So I really appreciate you guys coming out today. I know for a lot of you it was a couple hours to get here. And um, again, the, hopefully this, uh, this recording of this digitally will help other patients from distances get the access they need to information to make the decisions uh, as to move forward for surgical treatment to uh, of uh, obesity and we hope that if we can help you with your improved health through weight loss, we're happy to do that. So thank you very, very much for coming out today. Have a good day. Thanks.